Hello, my name is Sean Ernst, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about my master's thesis research here at the University of Oklahoma, where I've been investigating the interpretation of the Storm Prediction Center's convective outlook. For starters, I want to talk a little bit about some thoughts I found on Twitter in the last few weeks about the Storm Prediction Center outlook. In particular, started off by this tweet, which talked about how the wording moderate just isn't enough for them, at least for capturing the risk at hand on this particular risk day. A reply to that tweet agreed, finding that moderate risk is more dangerous than enhanced, but it doesn't feel like it is in terms of where those words should be in the rankings. They actually think that numbers would do a better job of describing the risk that is present on this day. Another Twitterer agreed that red is danger, but moderate really isn't. And that enhanced does sound worse than moderate, but it isn't. Another Twitterer suggests that maybe it's the low end of the scale that needs work, with marginal needing to get knocked off, and moderate reset to the literal middle as it is a middle-sounding word. And finally, this guy has a more impact-based interpretation of what the SPC outlook could look like, although I'm not sure how if that would be good enough for government work. There were two tweets, however, that really captured my attention and had some really interesting questions in them that I want to talk about here. First of all, the top tweet talks a little bit about how they're not sure if they like the ordering of the words in the outlook. So how do people actually interpret the risk indicators in the outlook, such as the words enhanced and moderate? Furthermore, do the two main indicators of wording and colors help or hinder individuals' understanding of the convective outlook? The second tweet talks a little bit more about how the, the SPC outlook gets to the public, noting that broadcasters are sending the information to the, to the public. How do broadcasters use the outlook to com communicate the risk of a severe weather event using the SPC outlook? And does evidence actually support the idea that outlooks are confusing to the public, or is this just an anecdotal assumption that we're making without knowing what's really going on? That is a question I intend to answer with this research, as well as with a few more other motivations. As I've shown, this is a widely and anecdotally discussed topic, especially on places like Twitter, where there's lots of people who are able to voice an opinion on this topic. However, additionally, the SPC outlook is very important to the warning enterprise. It performs an action called priming. It gets people ready for a potential tornado or severe weather event, sort of doing work beforehand by getting people to know that tornadoes might be coming, severe wind might be coming. Maybe I should think about preparing my tornado plan or double checking to make sure that I'm not going outside in the afternoon in case there's some dangerous weather out and about. It's preparing people to receive further warnings Morning. And there's actually a knowledge gap on this, uh, on, the, on the Outlook's interpretation. There's been plenty of work on the interpretation of tornado warnings, and there's been lots of work, especially done by Hitchens and Brooks, on the accuracy of the SBC Outlook, but there hasn't been a lot of study into the value of the Outlook, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But for starters, I want to show you the proposal for research that I put together. First, I really wanted to know how to broadcast meteorologists, such as this fine example right here, use the SPC convective outlook. Do they use that outlook to make better decisions? Do they see the outlook as a useful tool? And do they generate value from using the outlook and the information that it shares? Furthermore, I wanted to investigate how the general public interprets the SPC outlook. Do they interpret it correctly? Does their interpretation vary over different socio-demographic factors, such as age or race, or their ability to understand math and probabilities? And finally, do public misinterpretations line up with anecdotal evidence, such as that from Twitter, and broadcaster concerns, as I find in the first part of my investigation? Starting things off with the broadcaster investigation, I have a five-step process with which I'm going to explain some of my results here. First, I want to talk a little bit about how the SBC Outlook was developed. We have to understand where we came from in order to understand why the Outlook looks the way it does today. Second, what is forecast goodness and why does it matter? Third, I'm going to talk a little bit about my methods, how I collected data from the broadcasters about their opinions on the Outlook. And fourth, I'm going to talk about something that you might not have heard of if you haven't done a lot of social science or qualitative work, which is called thematic coding. 
I'm going to talk about its validity. And finally, I'm going to bring up the conclusions from my analysis. What value do broadcasters gain from the SPC outlooks? So first, a little bit of history on the SPC. The first tornado alerts were issued by Sergeant John P. Finley back in 1884. They were similar to modern watches, but covered massive parts of the country. In 1948, Major Fawbush and Captain Miller on Tinker Air Force Base issued the first tornado warning, which verified later that evening, saving the Air Force Base several million dollars in damages from the storm. Over time, their work developed into cells and the first version of the convective outlook by 1955. This outlook went over several changes throughout the years. In 1973, it was officially issued at 12Z, which it remains issued until it has been issued at that time since that day, every day. The slight risk category was added to moderate and high in 1974. In 1986, the first day two outlook came out, followed by the first day three outlook in 2000. And then finally, the four to eight day outlook in 2005, only 15 years ago. In 2003, the outlook was underwent a major change, wherein probabilistic likelihood of severe reports within a 25 mile radius of a given point were added and linked to the categories slight, moderate, and high. This was based off of work done by Brooks and Kay to link the convective outlooks issued in previous years to actual storm reports recorded on those storm days. In 2014, a major upgrade happened to the convective outlook at the request of some feedback by emergency managers. They were having trouble wondering, which slight risk am I getting today? As you can see in the probabilities on the bottom of this slide, for tornadoes, for example, slight covers the 5% and the 10% probability of a tornado within 25 miles of a point. This is a pretty big difference in the chance of a tornado near you. And emergency managers were picking up on this with some slight risk days being worse than others. In addition, the FEMA director had talked to SBC and was adamant that the moderate and high risk levels needed to be maintained and not changed because those levels have been encoded into law in many places where emergency managers are required to open their emergency operations centers if one of those risks is issued. So the SPC had to change the slight while maintaining the moderate and the high. Their solution, if you watch carefully on the image in the upper right, was this. They added a category called marginal to the lowest end, the C text, which helped better define the extent of expected severe weather for a given, out, uh, a given outlook. And then added a second tier of slight called enhanced slight, which was shortened to enhanced in the operational product. As you can see, that covers those higher end probabilities that showed up in the old original slight risk outlook. There was no change to the existing scale with the addition of these new categories. They simply changed C text to marginal and changed the higher end of slight to enhanced, adding more definition to the outlook probabilities. Now I want to talk a little bit about forecast goodness. What makes the SBC outlook or any other forecast like it a good forecast? There's three types of forecast goodness. The first is consistency, when what's in your head, the forecast that you're thinking of, is what you actually present to your viewers and the public. The second type of forecast goodness is accuracy, which you can see in this example of a practically perfect forecast diagram showing how storm reports would be perfectly captured by the probabilities for tornadoes in a convective outlook on the 12th of April 2020, which was a fairly significant tornado outbreak in the Deep South. The final type of forecast goodness is value. Value is a bit of a weird one because it doesn't necessarily come from the forecaster like the first two types do. Value comes from the decisions that users of a forecast make based on the information contained in that forecast because forecasts inherently have no value. An example could be this man receiving a tornado warning and taking shelter, thereby protecting his life and gaining value from that forecast. Consistency hasn't been studied too much. Accuracy has been studied quite a lot, especially with the SBC outlook, but value hasn't really been touched on. And that's what I seek to do in this study here. 
So in terms of data collection for the broadcaster segment, I wanted to identify the value that broadcasters are, are gaining from the Outlook by the decisions that they make using that Outlook. To do this, I first did something called cognitive task analyses. These CTAs are involve something called activities observations, wherein we asked broadcasters, like this one here, to explain how they would act on a given no-risk day, a slight risk day, and a high or moderate risk day. We completed 15 separate cognitive task analysis interviews over three years using a convenient sample of meteorologists that we reached out to and decided to participate in the hazardous weather testbed. I should put as a small aside a huge thank you to Dr. Cody Berry and Holly Obermeyer for collecting these cognitive task analyses. My part of the job was doing the analysis on them for this thesis. The second part of this data collection involved focus group interviews, which are small two to three participant group discussions where a moderator, in this case me, gives the group questions and allows the group to naturally discuss answers to those questions. I asked the participants to discuss how they handle marginal, enhanced, and slight risk days, or in high risk days, sorry, and how they would change their behavior given those different days. This is to try and tease out that value that the broadcasters are finding. The guide that I used to conduct the focus group interviews was based off of uh, designs made by Kruger and Breen, which will be included in the references in the end of this PowerPoint in case you're interested in learning more. There were four sessions that I completed with a total of nine participants, I used, again, a convenient sample of broadcasters that I reached out to and that had decided to participate in this study. Taking those interviews, I did something called thematic coding, which is a qualitative data analysis that allows you to identify, analyze, and report patterns, which we call themes, in qualitative data, which is data with words, not numbers. You must define your strategy and your methodology to ensure rigor in this process. You have to do things like journaling. You have to keep track of your themes. You have to keep track of the biases you might develop while completing the analysis. Because in this case, unlike most meteorology, the instrument you're using is only your brain. You're not using a thermometer to measure themes. Part of this coding is deciding whether to use inductive or deductive coding. Deductive coding is when you go into the coding with an idea in place. For example, I might think I want to look for people talking about how they don't like slight risk. I would make a code for that and then look for it in the data. Inductive coding is when codes naturally emerge from the data set. So for example, I might see in the data that people are complaining about slight a lot. So I would say, oh, I should have a code for slight and then use that on the rest of the data. I used a combination of these two techniques wherein I had some deductive codes I started with, but I allowed for inductive codes to appear if I felt they were necessary. I also did something called reflexive journaling where I kept track of what I was thinking about the data and the findings that I was uh, identifying during the coding process. This helps ensure that I can look back and see if I was biased during my analysis or if I was really truly finding patterns and themes. Finally. To organize this data, we do something called thematic mapping. You pull the excerpts that you link to codes out of your raw data and then look at them together to develop basic themes. You then, can under, you then put those basic themes under an umbrella of an organizing theme and finally link them all together to a global theme, which is an overall summary of the kind of patterns that you're seeing in your data. So, my thematic map for this analysis is as follows. I started with a global theme of outlook value, and I identified three sub-themes here. Outlook as a decision aid, the outlook as impacting behavior, and the outlook having issues. For decision aids, I found that risk messaging was something that broadcasters were using the outlook for, as well as as a sort of sanity check. The Outlook also increased the discussion with management and news directors at the station and, and made broadcasters get to work earlier than they would on a lower risk day. Additionally, broadcasters reported feeling anxiety before higher risk events. Finally, for issues, 
A lot of broadcasters talked about how we just don't get highs, which I thought was really interesting. And they also talked a little bit about translation problems they had with the Outlook. So talking a little bit about the risk messaging and what it looks like in the data, several meteorologists actually talked about taking the Outlook categories and creating these bar graphs that show low, medium, and high risks of tornadoes, hail, wind, and flooding. Other meteorologists talked about using the Outlook hatched areas or just the area in general to show where specific risks would occur and how likely those risks were to occur. For the sanity check, I found that broadcasters talked a lot about using it, the Outlook as a sort of situational awareness check. They would check it before bed, on wake up, to make sure that there wasn't any big changes to their expectations for the severe weather event, and to make sure that what they were thinking about what was going to unfold that day lined up with what the experts at the SPC were thinking. In terms of outlook impacts to behavior, I found that increased discussion with management occurred with higher risk levels. For lower or no risk levels, meteorologists would talk about briefly stopping by the newsroom meeting, but not really say, staying for very long and not really doing much. But for slight risk days, they would coordinate a little more, they would request things like live captioning, and they might bring other meteorologists in to talk a little bit about the threat. Of course, for high and moderate days, things get really serious, with one meteorologist talking about getting into battle mode. They'd also bring in the other meteorologists to speak at the meeting and would talk about things like coordinating where reporters would go if tornadoes or other danger or damaging events occurred and what responsibilities everyone in the news office would have during the event. As you can see, there's a clear increase in the communication and the preparation going on for the different risks, which suggests there might be some value added here. The final impact of behavior, or another impact of behavior, would be broadcasters arriving earlier to work. I created this table here with a um, comparison of each broadcaster's reported time arriving to work compared to a day with no risk for the slight risk and high moderate risk cases. As you can see, the average meteorologist got into work about an hour early on a slight risk day and over two hours early on a high or moderate risk day, suggesting that we're seeing a behavior change based on the risk of severe weather that day. Finally, a lot of meteorologists actually talked about having anxiety before these higher end days saying things like that they are nervous, it's nerve-wracking with severe weather potential, and that winding down can be difficult too. They also talked about how the day before the day, it's, it's a lot going on, you're juggling all sorts of things, it's very high intensity, and it's very stressful to deal with a higher-end day. One meteorolo two meteorologists actually even talked about having trouble sleeping before high-risk days with one meteorologist even going as far to take a sleeping pill to make sure they get enough sleep on the day before. This is a sign of some pretty significant anxiety that these meteorologists are feeling in advance of a severe weather outbreak that the SPC considers a high risk and is a potential negative impact to broadcasters from the outlook or the severe weather that comes with it. So in terms of the issues broadcasters had with the outlook, several broadcasters talked about not getting high risks. Some broadcasters had maybe one moderate risk day or never had a high risk day and talked a lot about how for them, the baseline for slight is high because those are their big days. So they wouldn't really change their behavior all that much for the higher risks. MET-17 came from an area where moderate and high risks are basically unheard of. The local definition would just be if storms occurred during a day and maybe did damage. Meteorologist 16 talked about how they had their first high risk ever back in January of the year that they were interviewed, but there had been a lot of busts in the past, so the whole high risk hadn't really lived up to it for them, at least in their interpretation of it. Finally. Broadcasters also talked a lot about having translation issues. Oftentimes with people struggling to understand the probabilities or the categories, and they really didn't want to show those to either news directors or their viewers because they felt it would be too confusing. Med18 had a really good analysis of why they didn't like the SPC products. 
talking about how the keep it simple stupid principle is important when you only have two minutes to present the information. They highlighted moderate risks and slight risks being hard to explain and potentially even giving the wrong message to the public. Meteorologist 8 actually has a very unique situation where they're a bilingual meteorologist that works with Telemundo and they have to translate the outlook into Spanish to present to their viewers. This is very difficult to do because the SPC hasn't really developed a lot of Spanish language aids for the outlook. There, have been a, there has been a lot of recent work done to advance this, such as that being led by Joseph Trujillo here at OU, um, but this is still an area of growth for the SPC, and it reflects overall that there has been a lack of study onto how the outlook can be best presented to broadcasters and the public. I also have not quite finished my thematic mapping for the focus groups, but I do have some early findings that I want to share with you guys today. First of all, broadcasters in the focus groups were finding that the SPC outlook is a good baseline for them, but they'd like to use model data and other observations to back up their own conclusions on what the severe risk for a given day is going to be. They also talked about bringing in greater staffing for higher risk days with bringing in every meteorologist, reporter, and photographer to make sure that they've got complete coverage of the severe weather event. They also talked about ramping up their messaging in the days leading up to a higher risk, hitting the messaging harder and harder with progressive days, although they would do this less for things like the no risk situations and the, and the enhanced or slight risk days. This was very much focused on the higher risk days because those are evident multiple days in advance. Finally, the meteorologists in the focus groups also talked about having serious issues with the terms in the convective outlook, such as Matt Seven, who said, if you ask anybody on the street, slight risk means really low. And I mean, they talked about this a lot. Met 5 suggested changing the naming system, and Met 4 says, what would moderate and slight be? What do they mean? Met 9 goes as far to say that they don't use the words at all when they present this convective outlook. And Met 1 went as far as to say that if they say there's a slight risk and a tornado goes through a city, they wouldn't show their face the next day. All impacts are local, and I think broadcast meteorologists may be one of the groups that see that more than any other. So in terms of some conclusions for this part of my investigation, the broadcaster study, I found similar findings across both data sets. The outlook is a baseline or a decision aid. It's not the final product that broadcasters are necessarily going to present to their publics. They use it to get a feel for what the experts are thinking about the day and then add their own interpretation and sometimes even reinterpret the graphic into their own specialized graphics. There's also multiple impacts to behavior from the SPC outlook and the severe weather that comes with it. They increase staffing on bigger days, making an active decision that yes, this is a day where we're going to need as much backup as we can get. They also reported feeling anxiety before severe weather events, which could be related to the SPC agreeing that this is going to be a significant day and that this could be really bad. It's a very human reaction, one that I've felt myself. For example, last year on May 20th, a high-risk day, I was out chasing with the Taurus uh, storm team. I didn't know if I would have an apartment to come home to looking at some of the model runs. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad, but it's a very relatable response. Finally, there were widespread issues that broadcasters had with the categorical words, especially slight and moderate. Those two words keep appearing in almost all of the focus groups and in a lot of the CTA analyses as well. So on to the second part of my overall investigation, which was looking at the general public. Now, the general public is a little bit harder to get data from if you want generalizable results because there's so many more people in the population. So I used a survey here instead of interviews so I could collect data, as much data as I possibly could. The first step of this, of course, is how did I ask questions to investigate public understanding of the outlook? Second, how did I collect data? Was this data collection randomized? Third, data analysis, how do I translate the data I collect into useful measures that I can perform statistical analyses with? What relationships do these statistical analyses find? 
And finally, what do these relationships tell us about the general public's knowledge of the convective outlook? So for starters, talking about survey design. I had two main questions that I asked the public in this survey. First, I asked them to rank from lowest to greatest the phrases used in the convective outlook. That would be marginal, slight, enhanced, moderate, and high. The second question asked them to rank from lowest to greatest the colors used in the SBC outlook, as you can see displayed at the bottom of your screen. To collect this data, I used I piggybacked off of the Center for Risk and Crisis Management's Severe Weather and Society 2019 survey. We surveyed U.S. residents over age 18, collecting 3,006 responses from a demographically representative sample. As you can see in this table here, data from the U.S. Census is in that middle column, while the participants, the percentages of each group of participants are shown in the right-hand column. As you can see, they're a very close match for each other, which allows us to potentially expand these findings and say that they're generalizable to the U.S. population as a whole. So in terms of initial findings, looking at those ranking questions, I looked at how pe what word people chose for each, most often for each ranking level. So starting with the first ranking level, we find that participants really liked having slight as the first risk level, with marginal coming in at a second. So already off to a great start here. For the second risk word, participants favored marginal, but only barely over slight. You can also see that the proportions of participants in each group is a little bit higher than it was in the first graphic. That suggests that people were a little more confused about what they wanted to use as the second risk word. For the third risk word, moderate won out quite handily over the others, and it was a little more certain, unlike the second risk word. For the fourth risk word, enhanced wins out, but like the second risk word, we see that the proportions for moderate and high, as well as even marginal, are a little bit higher, suggesting there was some confusion about what to put for the fourth risk word. Finally, for the fifth risk word, you can see that high completely demolished the field with almost all participants agreeing that high was the place to go, 60 over 60% of them, in fact. There were some that liked enhanced and slight, but moderate did not hardly ever show up in the fifth risk word. So overall, you can see at the top of the screen what participants were thinking the outlook should look like based on their interpretation of the words, which is a little bit concerningly different from the outlook as it exists. Second, for the color ranking, we did the same thing, finding that green was absolutely the first choice for the lowest risk color. That agrees with what we know of the SPC outlook. The second risk color, yellow wins out, a little less handily than green, but still prominently featured for the second risk color. Interestingly, it was magenta that actually got second in the second risk color. It was the second most preferred risk color, which is something we'll see occurring more later. For the third risk color, orange wins out, although yellow is getting a little bit closer there. So we're starting to see a little bit of confusion on how the rankings should go. And for fourth risk color, things really go off the rails. Red, which is the correct fourth risk color, is in third place, with magenta only barely beating out orange for the most preferred fourth risk color. Finally, for the fifth risk color, you can see that red absolutely dominated, with magenta a distant second. This suggests that people are confusing those two high-end colors and it seems like magenta is the real offender here, considering that it, uh, it features prominently in the other risk colors. So it suggests that magenta is what people are really having trouble with. In terms of the groups by rank order, I also decided to look at the data by comparing how many people ranked the SPC outlook words and colors in a certain way. For example, 505 people decided to rank the words by slight, marginal, moderate, enhanced, and high. 
The correct ordering of the words, as you can see, is the fourth largest group here at 205 participants. For color, green, yellow, orange, magenta, red had 477 participants, but as you can see, the second most popular group was the correct ordering. So it seems like the colors might be doing a little bit better than the words overall in terms of the interpretation and how well they, ma they match people's understanding of the risk that each indicator is communicating. I did some further data analysis though so I could perform some statistics on this data by creating a ranking skill score. The first step was to subtract input values from correct values. So for example, as you can see on the top row of these colors here, someone thought that yellow should be first, green should be second, orange third, magenta fourth, and red fifth. Compared to the actual outlook, which is green, yellow, orange, red, magenta, we can see that there's some discrepancy here. So I'd subtract those values from the actual values to get these differences. I then take the sum of the absolute value of those differences, which in this case is four, divide that by two, and subtract that value from the number six to invert the skill score so that a higher score is perfect and a lower score of zero is imperfect. We can then perform statistics using individuals' ranking skill scores. I built a multiple linear a uh, multiple re linear regression model to look at the in our dependent variables, which were the word and color scores that I just developed in that last slide, and compare them to independent variables such as age, education, and other things like their region in the country. Of these results, we found that four independent variables had very strong relationships with the two scores, namely age, race, numeracy, which is a measure of individuals' ability to understand probabilities in math, and their ability to determine whether or not they could, or their ability to determine whether a prompt we gave them was a tornado warning or a tornado watch. That's the incorrect versus correct tornado comprehension. So looking at that data a little bit further, we can see that uh, there is a negative relationship between age and SBC word and color score, with more elderly individuals scoring worse than younger individuals. It's not a really steep slope. They only decrease in skill by about a point, but it's definitely there, and it's definitely a potential vulnerable population when people can't interpret the score or can't interpret the outlook as well if they're older. Second, numeracy. Again, numeracy is an individual's ability to understand math and probabilities. We find that more numerate individuals are much better at interpreting the SPC words and colors. However, as you can see, there are not as many numerate individuals in our, uh, in our data. A lot more people are less numerate. This suggests that there could be a lot of vulnerability in the population with people not understanding the outlook because they don't have a level of numeracy required to correctly interpret the probabilities and the categories that are being used in the current version of the outlook. Now this one is a little concerning to me. Uh, out of all of my findings, I think actually this is the most concerning. Whites in our survey data were much better scoring on both the SBC word and color than black or African American participants and participants of other races. This suggests that we are failing a large portion of Americans with our current version of the Storm Prediction Center convective outlook. I strongly suggest that if anything comes out of my research, I hope that further research into why this population is being disserviced by the outlook is occurring, why this is occurring, and see if we can find solutions to help make sure that everyone can understand this vital severe weather information, especially considering how damaging severe weather has been just this year alone. Finally, we found that people who were able to determine the difference between a tornado watch and a warning were much better scoring than those who could not. This makes sense because people who've seen and likely understand tornado watches and warnings have probably also seen the convective outlook. 
whereas those that are less do not understand the difference between a watch and a warning, may not be as weather knowledgeable, and thus may not understand the outlook from having learned about it. I also did some further analysis, not quite with statistical models, but instead just comparing the groups by, their, uh, by the demographics of age and numeracy. So for example, I would compare what the numeracy of the first group of 505 people in the word table, what their numeracy was compared to the correct um, group, which was down at fourth place with 205 participants. And I'll show those graphs now. First, for age, we see that there's not a whole lot of difference between the groups. Um, the most correct, or the correct ordering of the group is on the left side of both of these graphs in the red, while the other groups are presented in descending order of size. So as you can see, for the risk word ordering, it's kind of all over the place. There's no clear pattern in terms of a relating age to their skill at um, ordering the words. However, there's a little bit more of a, a pattern in the risk colors, but it's still not super significant, so it's, it's, I would say, mixed results for age. However, numeracy by group, this is a big one. Remember that the correct group is on the left in the red, while the less correct groups are in uh, si decreasing size as you go further to the right. So the correct groups for both word and color were more numerate than the incorrect groups. This makes sense compared to the statistical model, and it suggests that the SBC outlook as it stands best serves more numerate individuals. So in terms of conclusions of this section of the study, we found that people were definitely having more trouble with the words than they were with the SPC colors and that there were four demographics that were really influential on individuals' ability to interpret the outlook. Specifically, score decreased with age, increased with numeracy, or their ability to understand math and probabilities. It was higher for whites versus African Americans and blacks and other races. And scores were higher for participants that could correctly define the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. We also found that the correct ordering of the outlook words and colors was not most popular, although the second largest group was the correct ordering for color, and the fourth largest group was the correct ordering for words, again seeing that words are causing more trouble than colors. We also found that numeracy was higher for the correct and largest groups for both colors and words, which suggests, again, that numeracy is a big player in individuals' ability to interpret the outlook. So to wrap everything up in a nice bow with final conclusions and summary, anecdotal concern over the SPC outlook words appears validated in the data. Both broadcasters, speaking semi-anecdotally, but also in their experience as broadcasters, and data from the general public suggest that the SBC word ranking isn't quite lining up with individuals' interpretations of the risk associated with those words. The outlook colors, however, were generally better interpreted and were preferred by broadcasters who like to use the outlook to show where the areas of greatest threat are. The outlook is used by broadcasters as a guideline and a decision aid, but it's only one of many tools that they use, including models and observations, to build a story for a severe weather event. And finally, outlooks can have behavioral and emotional impacts, including increased anxiety for broadcasters. And these impacts are something that we should consider when, in that, when realizing that yes, the SBC outlook does have value and it is an important product, even if it isn't communicating in the most effective way that we know of yet. I'd also like to quickly give some references. As you can see, there's all the papers in the lower left that I referenced in this presentation, and I'd like to give a few acknowledgements. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Joe Ripberger for guiding my growth as a researcher at the CRCM and for always having more work for me to do. 
I'd like to thank Dr. Harold Brooks, who's my advisor here at the School of Meteorology, for showing me that forecast goodness, as defined by Murphy, is the way, and for being a fantastic advisor, even if he hasn't quite found a way to needle me yet. I'd like to thank Dr. Cody Berry and Holly Obermeyer for welcoming, welcoming me into their broadcaster study at the Hazardous Weather Testbed and sweating it out in a tiny broadcaster room with me. It was really hot in there. I'd like to th thank my coworker, Kenzie Krochak, for helping me polish and eviscerate this presentation into a viewable state. Trust me, it was almost an hour and 15 minutes long, and we're only at about 40 minutes now. It's a lot better. Finally, I'd like to thank the CRCM and NIRR teams for welcoming me into their working group, making me feel at home, and supporting and funding my research. I couldn't do it without them. And finally, thank you to the, all my friends and mentors throughout the years who have supported me, kept me healthy, and given me a reason to do the research that I do. I owe you all so much, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, please email me at sean.ernst at ou.edu, or feel free to shoot me a direct message or tweet at me at sean underscore ernst underscore wx. I will be tweeting some of the conclusions of this uh, presentation today so that you can check them out today being April 24th, 2020. Um, and that is also a version that could be better viewed by uh, individuals who are hard of hearing. In any case, again, thank you for listening to my presentation, and I hope you all enjoyed it.